Let's bow our hearts in prayer before we look at God's word. Heavenly Father, we are reminding one another this morning in song, in word, that there is so much more than the things we see. And the things we see are temporary. They are passing away. But there are things which are unseen, revealed to us through your word, by your spirit, which are eternal. And Lord, it is the unseen that we are going to be experiencing for eternity. The things that are seen are just a temporary experience. And yet, Lord, for many, they have such a, a hold on us. We pray this morning that as we look into your word, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us insight and understanding to recognize what are the things that we should be fixing our eyes onto and attaching our hearts to and clinging to and what are the things that we should be freeing ourselves of, disengaging ourselves from, and trusting you to release their attachment from our hearts? Father, I pray that you would give wisdom. I pray that you would enable each one of us to see and apply the truths of your word to our hearts, to our lives today. And I pray that you would give us the wisdom to follow hard after Jesus, trusting in Jesus, rejoicing in you, Jesus, for you are it. You are our focus, you are our life, our passion, and we love you. And I pray for your enabling I pray, Lord, that you would have your way with me through your word. Give us insight and understanding, I pray. And enable us to apply these things, as I ask, Lord, to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I want to give a special greetings to you mothers and uh, wish you a happy Mother's Day. And we honor you. Uh, the role of mother is uh, highly esteemed in the word of God, should be highly esteemed by the people of God, uh, though it is very much underrated in the world. Uh, there is no substitute who can take the place of mom in the lives of children. And uh, so we, we do want to honor you. My message this morning is not uh, a Mother's Day message, but it is very relevant to mothers and to the rest of us. I want to begin, though, by reading from uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, and then we'll go back to Galatians chapter 5. But Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 the Bible says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There are weights, there are things that encumber us, that entangle us, and sin that encumbers and entangles, and we are to throw it all aside, cast it aside. But what are those weights? What are those things that are spoken of in addition to the sin that entangles us as Christians. 
Uh, we're going to look a little bit at that this morning. We'll be looking at it a little more in the next study. But I believe that most of us in this room today, uh, though only God knows the heart, but I believe most of us are born-again Christians. Most of us can give a testimony of how and when we came to that place of recognizing that there was nothing we could do to save ourselves, but we were thoroughly convinced that we needed to be saved from the guilt of our sin. And the message that we have been studying in Galatians so far has been a message that most of us have already believed and embraced, that there is only one way to experience salvation, only one. Yeah, the world calls that narrow, but the Bible calls it the gospel, the good news. What is the one way to experience salvation? It is by God's grace alone. He does it all. He's the author, the finisher, the starter, the ender of it. And salvation is activated through faith alone. It's by grace alone and through faith alone. There is no work that needs to be done. He did all that needs to be done at the cross, and we receive it by believing. And there is only one object of faith. It's in Christ alone that we put our faith. We don't put faith in Christ plus a religious system. It's Christ alone. By grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. The way of salvation is a very narrow way. It's a very singular way. Jesus described it as such. In Matthew chapter 7, Verses 13 and 14, Jesus said, Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult. That word difficult doesn't mean as in hard work, but difficult in the sense of being very restrictive, very difficult to accept. Difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. If you're carrying a lot of baggage, you're not going to fit through this narrow passage. Some ancient gates uh, in a walled city, you'd come to a city, there were some large gates, but there were some small gates, basically a man door. If you were entering on a donkey or on a mule or on a camel, uh, you would have to get off and lead it through. If you had any baggage that you were carrying, a pack or baggage on your mule, your donkey, you would have to take it off and piece by piece put it through. That is a narrow gate. But notice it is not only a narrow gate not only a narrow entrance that once you've got through, there's a broad path on the other side, but the path on the other side of the gate is also a very narrow, restrictive path. Some of you who've been to ancient Jerusalem or other ancient cities, you've seen some of what they call streets, I've only seen pictures of them, but you could put out your hand on each side and, and touch the wall. Uh, it's a narrow way, a narrow street. This implies that the same narrow, singular principles for getting into salvation and onto the path of salvation, those same singular, narrow principles are going to continue to be the principle for living the Christian life once you are on that path. That's what this passage is speaking about. The, narrow, the path, the gate is narrow, but so is the path, restrictive. This is where my heart as a pastor is burdened for our congregation. Many have come through the gate, but have now lost the way. The Christian life is to be lived out of the same way 
are to be lived out the same way that it is entered into. By God's grace alone. He does it all on our behalf. He doesn't just get us saved, but he gets us all the way. It's him who does it. And it is to be lived by faith alone, in Christ alone. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. And verse 4. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. How did you receive him? By grace alone. Through faith alone. In Christ alone. As you have received him, so walk in him. So live out your Christian life in the same way that you began your Christian life. It's Jesus and trusting in Jesus only. Verse 8 of Colossians 2. Beware lest anyone cheat you. Brothers and sisters, beware lest anyone cheat you, rob you of experiencing the life that Christ has for you. Lest anyone cause you to miss out on experiencing the life that God intends for you. How are they going to do that? Through philosophy? That's mental, logical reasoning? Rational thinking? that's independent of the word of God. Let, beware lest anyone cheat you. How? Through empty deceit, according to the tradition of man. What's the tradition of man? This is the way Christians have always lived. This is the way your parents lived, your grandparents lived. Why can't you live this way? Tradition. According to the basic principles of the world. This is the way the world does it. This is the pattern of the world. This is the value system of the world. You're in this world, live like the world. And not according to Christ. That's what's going to rob you. Not according to Christ. What did Christ teach? How did Christ live? That must be our pattern. That must be what we fix our eyes on. Jesus said, he who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Sometimes, though we are to honor our parents, we need to break away from their traditions that we might follow Jesus Christ. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's now turn to Galatians chapter 5. Verse 13, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We, we like this, We've been called to liberty. We talked about this last week, so I'm not going to spend much time on it, but that liberty isn't what is so often in the, the minds of men that free to do what I want to do. That's not what it's talking about. Our liberty or freedom is not freedom to indulge our own desires. But what is it? It is, I have been set free at last to follow Jesus Christ. I have been set free at last to live that life that in the flesh, in the old man, in my own efforts and own strengths, I could never achieve to, I could never live it, I could never experience it. The law said I had to, but I could not. Jesus Christ set me free from 
my inabilities and my weaknesses and the bondage of the law and the bondage of my flesh. He set me free from those things that hindered that I can follow Jesus Christ. Free from condemnation. And he has set me free to serve others. The last part of verse 13, through love, serve one another. That is esteeming others above myself and putting them before myself. I used to be, before I came to Christ, selfish, self-centered. It was all about me, myself, and I. I lived for me. I lived for my pleasures. I lived for what was good for me. The gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God has set me free from that. I can now live oriented towards others. Receiving from Christ and pouring out his blessing towards others. That is the freedom that Christ has set us for, set us free for. In verse 1 of chapter 5, Paul said that our Christian liberty or freedom can be lost. We can become entangled again in bondage to sin, in bondage to the law, and bondage to the flesh. We lose our freedom when we do not walk in total dependence upon God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to make my Christian life successful and fulfilling. We looked at last week when we try adding some other things as essential ingredients to give me fulfillment in life. I miss out then, I lose on, I negate, I cancel out the grace of God. But I experience his grace when I recognize it's Jesus. It's Jesus only that can fulfill me. It's in following Jesus only that I'm going to find abundant life. Not in following Jesus and let me bring this along as well or bring that along as well. I I need this and I need that as well as Jesus. The gate is narrow and so is the pathway narrow. No, no place for baggage. Jesus only. Many of you hate to admit it. Maybe I shouldn't say many. Some of you hate to admit it. But your Christian life today is not very fulfilling. Like verse 7 says, In the past there was a time when you ran well. You were excited about Jesus. You were excited to be growing in him. Who or what has hindered you? Here, the Lord begins by giving us some direction in Galatians to finding our way back to that narrow path, back to that narrow way where we will find the freedom to live like Jesus. You get off that narrow path and you lose the freedom to live. You can't live like Jesus. But beware, as we move forward in Galatians, we are going to have to get rid of some baggage to be able to fit down this narrow street called walking by the Spirit. Anyone got some baggage that you want to get rid of? And maybe there's some baggage you don't want to get rid of. And Lord, I pray that you would put in our heart an eager willingness to let go of everything that is hindering, that we might run with perseverance the race that Jesus Christ has marked out for us. If you're off the path, if you're trying to accommodate other things, uh, may God set you free from that. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What a powerful, hopeful promise. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not. God's promise, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What does it mean to walk by the Spirit? Or in some translations, to walk in the Spirit. Notice that the word spirit is spelled with a capital S. That means it's referring to God, the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, the same idea is stated where it says, led by the Spirit. In verse 25, some translations express it as to keep in step with the Spirit. They're all talking about the same thing. 
So we are to walk being led by the Holy Spirit, but don't think of it as a situation in which he leads and we follow, though there's a sense in which we follow him, but there is a greater sense in which we need to understand where is Christ. He's in me. So we follow him, but not as though he's ahead and I'm behind trying to keep up. Who can keep up with Jesus? We follow Jesus in the sense that he's in and he's prompting and he's speaking and he's influencing, he's guiding, he's directing, and we follow that influence, we follow that prompting of his spirit inside of us. So we are to walk by the spirit, being led by the spirit, um, and he leads us, directs us from within. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13, it is God who works in you both to will, he puts in you the will, and to do. He enables you to do what he causes you to will to do for his good pleasure. So this is pretty, pretty helpful for anyone who wants to live like God, to live like Jesus, the Son of God, uh, walk by the Spirit. Let's look at the word walk. What does it mean to walk? In the Bible, that word walk means to the, the way that we habitually live out our lives. It refers to your daily lifestyle. Your, your, how do you live your life? What do you do every day? Tell me what you do Monday through Sunday, or Sunday through Saturday. Tell me what you do at work. Tell me what you do at home. Uh, what is your schedule? What does your activity look like? That is your walk, the way you live out your lives. It refers to your lifestyle daily. It refers also to the direction that you're going. Where are your priorities? Where is your focus? Where, where are you headed with your life? When the Bible talks about our walk, it's talking about every aspect of our life from the minute we wake up in the morning till we fall asleep at night. Uh, our walk is all of our life. That's our walk. To walk in the Spirit or to be led by the Spirit means that moment by moment, from the time I get out of bed till I fall asleep at night, day by day, I'm to go where the Lord is going. I'm to listen to his voice, to discern his will, to know his thoughts, to follow his guidance, while depending upon his spirit inside of us to enable and make it possible to accomplish what he is prompting me to do. That is to walk after the spirit, or to walk by the spirit, or to walk in the spirit, it is nearly synonymous with what Jesus told us to do in John chapter 15, where he taught us to abide in me, or to remain in me, or to live our lives in vital union and connection with him. That's what it means to walk by the Spirit. I am connected. I am being influenced. I am in following his prompting, his leading. John chapter 15 we know that passage, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, or remain in me, or think of yourself as, as a branch that is fastened to the vine. It draws all of its life, all of its energy from that vine. Everything it needs comes from the vine. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, Neither can you unless you abide in me, Jesus said. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, or he who walks in the Spirit, or is led by the Spirit, and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. So to walk by the Spirit is to get from God everything that you need for every moment that you live your life, from the minute you get out of bed to the minute you fall asleep, everything that you need, trusting that God will supply, depending on him to do it, putting no confidence in anything else but God alone. Now let's go back to our text in Galatians 5.16. 
I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. As we saw last week, uh, the desires of the flesh are desires to do the things that God says no to, and desires to not do the things that he wants you to do. The flesh is the old cravings, old appetites, old memories, the old habits, and ungodly ways of thinking and reacting, the baggage that was left behind in our life after we got saved, and our sinful nature was removed from our lives, but that old baggage, the old ways of thinking and feeling and acting and doing are still there. And when those things are acted upon, that's the flesh. Victory over the flesh is not obtained by going to war against those desires. Victory is obtained by pursuing relationship with Jesus Christ and trusting him to go to war against those sinful desires, trusting him to give us victory over our sin as we depend upon him. So we put all these truths together to form a train of thought that goes like this. Those sinful desires, the old ways of, of living that look like unbelievers if we let them work out in us, those sinful desires of our flesh are overcome by habitually, daily, putting our faith in God's spirit and fully trusting in and relying upon his grace moment by moment to guide us into righteous living, to bring our rebellious flesh into subjection and obedience to the will of God. It's trusting God to do it, to work it out. So I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. This verse is the key to living in victory over sin and temptations. And like our salvation, our godly living is experienced by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. What is it that's robbing us? It's thinking that we need something other than Christ alone. This passage is the key to resisting the temptation to look at pornography. It's to say, God, I agree with you that this is a destructive sin which you hate, and it will ruin my life. I acknowledge that apart from you, I have no power over this temptation. I can't resist, but you can. And you live inside me. And you are in me to enable me. Lord, I choose to depend upon you, to depend upon your spirit in me, to empower me to walk in purity, to empower me to turn away from those temptations. I trust you, Lord, to keep my eyes on those things which are pure and to find my life and joy and satisfaction in you. Living by the Spirit is the key to living a single life with purity and a sense of fulfillment. It's, Lord, I can't on my own, but you live in me to graciously give me everything that I need, including contentment, fulfillment, fruitfulness, and joy. Lord, your word says that you are my life. Your word says that you fulfill me and that I am complete in you alone. I believe your word. You are living in me to provide me everything that I need for abundant life. As you empowered Jesus to live a fulfilled, abundant, single life of joy, I believe your same spirit lives in me to empower me to be like Jesus. Living by the Spirit is the key to living a happy married life. It's the same principle. Lord, I don't find my fulfillment in my partner. I don't find my completeness in my partner. I don't find my life in my partner. I find it all in you. And I love my partner out of the overflow of the love that you give me. Being led by the Spirit is the key to gaining victory 
over materialism. Why are we materialistic? Because we don't believe that Jesus is all that we need. We don't believe his word that says we can be content with food and clothing. And so we acquire and pursue after and accumulate things and more things and more things trying to find the happiness and the fulfillment that are in Christ alone. The world says that I need these name brand clothes. You see, it gets beyond just clothes. I need these name brand clothes. I need a nice car. I need a nice house. I need a nice vacation. I need lots of toys in order to be successful and happy. That's what the world says. But (laughs) I've decided to follow Jesus. I believe your word, Jesus, which says that I can be content with only having food and clothing because you are the only true source of life. You are my source of joy. You have come to live inside of me so that in you I might have abundant life. In you I might have fullness of joy. In you I might have pleasure both now and forevermore. I choose to seek my life and to find my joy in fixing my eyes on Jesus, running with perseverance the race that he has marked out for me, not the race that the world has marked out for me, Jesus. And I throw off everything that hinders so that I can follow Jesus. Last Sunday, one of you were telling me about the harassment and bullying you were experiencing at work and wondering what recourse you could take, who you could talk to to help this situation. And then you thought, I'm going to go home and talk to God about it. And I'm going to trust him to take care of it. Brothers and sisters, that is being led by the Spirit. That is walking after the Spirit. And so many, many other examples and ways. It's, why am I pursuing? Why am I indulging in? Why am I distracted by these other things in life? It's because I'm not trusting that Jesus is all I need. Isn't that unrealistic? <laughs> Jesus said it. I believe him. And he also said that if we don't believe this, we're not going to experience the fullness of the life that he has come to give. Galatians 5.17 goes on to say, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. This verse describes a war, a conflict, that rages inside the heart of every Christian. Though our body and soul are ever increasingly brought into subjection to the Spirit of God as we mature, and we can gain victory over giving in to the desires of the flesh, we will, however, never be entirely free from feeling that temptation of the desires of the flesh which oppose the desires of the spirit until we are set free from these bodies and receive our glorified bodies. Our bodies aren't the problem, but the problem resides in our bodies. And when these bodies are gotten rid of, we're going to get glorified bodies that are going to be free from flesh. And we will have renewed minds that are free from the flesh, that rebellion, that resistance to the will of God. For the desires of the flesh, verse 17 says, are against the spirit. The desire to have something more than Christ, something other than Christ to make my life fulfilling, to make my life satisfying, 
That's against the Spirit. That's against God. And the desires of the Spirit, that Jesus is all I need, that goes against my flesh. That goes against your flesh. You're, you're feeling that tension this morning as we talk about this, as we think about it. Your flesh says, no way. Remember, it's like the, uh, the civil servants that are left behind when new government comes in and new government says, we're doing things a new way. And the civil servants say, no way. <laughs> That's what happens inside us when Christ comes in and takes over and there's a rebellion inside that says, no way, I want to do things my way. The desires of the flesh are against the spirit. This means because of this conflict, the liberty that we have in Christ, the freedom that we have in Christ is not freedom to do what I want to do. Nobody has that freedom. We are either a slave of sin, cooperating with the flesh, doing what I want to do as opposed to God's will, or we are a slave of Christ, um, a bond servant of Christ, gladly choosing to yield to him. And as I trust in his enabling, he gives me the freedom from the desires of my flesh, the freedom from those cravings of my flesh. He gives me the freedom to find victory over that and to walk in newness of life, to walk in the ways of God. But Jesus only, Jesus only, our flesh resists that. Our flesh rejects that. Some want to live a life of moderation. Well, Jesus mostly. But a little bit of this and a little bit of that, just to keep life interesting, to spice it up. I want to life, live a life of moderation, just a little indulgence of the desires of the flesh. Freedom to, to watch a racy movie now and then. Freedom to indulge in a little sexual flirting just for the fun of it. Or maybe freedom to just have a little too much to drink every once in a while where there's a, a good reason for celebrating. Some call it moderation to indulge the flesh in a few luxuries, to indulge the flesh in pursuing the pleasures of life, but still living a good moral life, just indulging in a little of this and a little of that. This goes contrary to the radical call of Jesus to deny yourself, take up your cross, Reckoning that the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We're dead to one another. And I'm following Christ. This requires faith in the goodness and the truthfulness of God who says, this is the way of abundant life. This is the way of fullness of joy. This is the way of pleasure that will not pass in a few hours or moments, but will last for a lifetime. And yet our flesh says, uh-uh, that smells like death. I'm not going there. And we choose the flesh, or at least we choose to add a little of the flesh's influence to the grace of God. And I got the best of both worlds. That's not what Jesus teaches such a life of moderation is compromise. You think it's adding just a bit of flesh to your walk with the Lord, but in reality, it is walking after the flesh, period, not after the spirit. Just as there is no such thing as adding a little law to grace and having it still work to get you into salvation, so there is no such thing as adding a little flesh to grace. Grace works alone, or you are on your own. That is the principle. God does not come to partner with our flesh. God does not come to partner with the, the, the law. 
The grace of God is he does it all. We are saved by grace and we live the Christian life by grace. And as we will see in more detail next week, such a life will not experience, such a life of compromise will not experience or express the fruit of the Spirit, which is described for us in verse 22. If you are led by the flesh, you will not experience the fruit of the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, and you will not experience that chronic defeat and failure. You cannot mix the two. If you try to mix them, by default, you are walking after the flesh, which says, I will do things my way. Yeah, I like some of your way, God, so I'm going to include that, but I also like some of this way. And so I'm making my own mixture, my own combination. This is why the Christian life doesn't work for many. This is why we so often fail to experience the joy of the Lord. Jesus demands exclusivity. We can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and mammon. You can't serve both God and myself. You can't serve God and anything else. Jesus said, if anyone would be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross, reckon himself dead to the world and the world dead to me, and follow exclusively me, Jesus said. Follow Christ. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Notice that this is a conditional statement. Freedom from the law and the bondage it brings is found in being led by the Spirit. Freedom is lost when we do not trust that leading of the Spirit. And we try adding other sources of pleasure, other sources of life, other sources of security. Or we grow impatient with the Lord's timing. And we try and make things happen by our own effort. I need to help. I need to do it. Remember Abraham and Sarah. Um, let's use Hagar. It doesn't work. When we are not being led by the Spirit, we find ourselves under the demands and the condemnation of the law, which requires that we do the work. Now, how does that play itself out in our Christian life? I think that I need to add a little of this spice and a little of that spice. Uh, Now, all of a sudden, the centrality, the core, the heart of my life, Jesus Christ, isn't fulfilling. It isn't working. It isn't bringing the victory. It isn't bringing the satisfaction. Well, now I need a little more of this and a little more of that because Jesus is not satisfying anymore. How do we find life and fulfillment in Jesus Christ? Throw off everything else that hinders and run with perseverance, tenacity, stick to the race marked out for you, fixing your eyes on Jesus. Either we trust the Lord and depend on him and find him faithful, or we choose to do it all, and we must try and find life, and we must try and make life, and we must try and make life work, It doesn't mean the Lord has abandoned us, but it means that we are not trusting his promise. We are not trusting him as the source of life. And so be it unto you according to your faith. You don't believe, you're not going to experience. God loves you, he cares for you, but he weeps over you because this is not the way that he has meant your life to be. Jesus is your life. Jesus only. Heavenly Father, I pray 
I pray that you would begin identifying in our lives that baggage, those extra things that we have piled on, thinking they are vital, thinking they are important, thinking that they add to life. When, Lord, your word tells us they rob us, they take away from us, they hinder us from experiencing the life that is found when we are exclusive in our devotion to you. Lord, this requires wisdom on our part. But above all, it requires faith that your word is more true than the word of the world's financial planners. Your word is more true than the world, word of the world's politicians and educators. Your word is more true than the word of the entertainers. Your word is more true than the word of the world. Lord, teach us to trust your word and to live our life in such a way that we prove you are better. You are better than anything else. I ask you to work this in our hearts by your Holy Spirit, to put in our hearts the will and the desire and to enable us to run in this path. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.